All right, another class on Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews, The Glorious Jesus. This is lesson number 13 in the series, uh, The Glory of the Church of Christ, and uh, the title of this particular section here, The Church of Christ is Holy, Part One. So we've said that the uh, purpose of the author of this particular epistle was to persuade his readers not to abandon Christianity and return to Judaism. And he does this by showing how Jesus is superior and more glorious than any part or person within the Jewish religion, that Jesus is the fulfillment of that religion. Next, he says that God's people in every age glorify God by their faithfulness, and it's no different now. Jesus' disciples, his church glorifies Him by their faithfulness. Jesus has glorified the church by what He has done. The church glorifies Jesus by their faithfulness. So he emphasizes this point by parading a long list of Jewish heroes who all persevered under trial because of faith. And even though they died without ever possessing the promises, by faith, he says, they saw them from afar and died without giving hope. So the unmentioned point to his readers is that they have seen the promise of salvation realized in Jesus Christ. You know, they've, you know, the people he's writing to, they've seen Jesus, they've, they've heard of what He has done, He's fulfilled all the promises that were made to the people in the Old Testament, and they have a much better basis for their faith, for their belief. They also have a much stronger reason for their hope. You know, they've actually seen Jesus. He's actually died and resurrected. Okay? And so he says to them, this should help them not to abandon their faith. In fact, it should help them to persevere all the more. You see the contrast? You know, he says, if the people in the Old Testament, all these people here, heroes of faith, uh, who persevered, despite the fact that they didn't see the promise fulfilled, but they hung in there anyways, you people, you've seen the promise fulfilled, certainly you should also continue in faith because you have a better basis for your faith and your hope. So uh, just as the vision created by their faith enabled the prophets of the uh, Old Testament to overcome obstacles and die faithfully serving God, even though they only had a, a glimpse of the promise, the much clearer vision created by the faith in the fully revealed plan of God through Jesus Christ should motivate the people of the New Testament, the New Covenant, to holiness and to service as well. So because we've seen Christ, because the promise is fulfilled, not only should we be faithful, he says, but we should also be uh, uh, holy and we should also pe be a, a people of service. So in the final section of this epistle, the author is going to describe the holy life produced and made possible by one whose eyes have been opened by faith. And so he begins with the example of Jesus. The people saw from afar the promises. Today, he says, we see Jesus. And the author says that his example of faith should be the motivating factor to holiness, to our acting in a holy way, and to our perseverance. So let's, uh, let's uh, begin reading uh, chapter 12 in verse 1. So he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so he creates a kind of a scene where the, he compares the Christian life to a race, where those who have successfully run are now spectators cheering on the present contestants. And so the Old Testament examples of faith, all those men and women of faith that he mentioned before in the previous chapter, now he says these people are kind of witnesses, if you wish. They're the audience that surround the present day Christian in a race uh, for faith. And like long distance runners, uh, you know, are lightly uh, dressed and well-trained. He says that Christians um, must also not be bogged down, not with clothing, of course, but bogged down with, with sinfulness and worldly concerns, and they need to be ready to run a race of endurance if they expect to, if they expect to finish. So he keeps going. 
He says, uh, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So in the Old Testament, they saw the promise of salvation from afar. Uh, Christians, on the other hand, clearly see salvation in Jesus Christ, and the author says they are urged to fix their focus on Him and not be distracted by any other, uh, any other thing. And the reason for this is that uh, it is in and through Jesus that our faith was sparked. Okay, so he's saying you know, Jesus is the one at the beginning who sparks our faith, gets us into the race, and He's also you know, there during the race encouraging us through these witnesses, and He's at the end of the race to welcome those who successfully finish the race. So he gives Jesus as a supreme example uh, of a racer who succeeded. Uh, he focused on the joy that he was to experience, and the joy that Jesus was to experience was to return to sit at the right hand of God after having obtained salvation uh, for uh, all those who would believe. That was the joy, that was the motivation. This focus, he says, enabled him to endure the mocking and the shame, the suffering and the death of the cross. And so let's continue reading verse three. He says, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So he says, in every circumstance, the key to finishing the race is to keep the focus on Jesus Christ. And, and how he endured without failing to reach the end of his race. So you know, he says, Jesus the example, look at what he went through and how did he do it? He stayed focused. He stayed focused on the end game. And what was the end game? Well, to provide salvation. He wanted to save us. And the cross was the, the entry, it, it was the, the, the thing that he had to go through in order to accomplish that goal. So how do we stay focused? Well, we stay focused, uh, certainly we're not going to a, quote, physical cross, but the way that we focus, well, through prayer, through worship, we, we stay focused spiritually, through the study of God's word, through obedience to the Spirit, service in the name of Jesus, witness of faith, that's how I stay focused, that's how we stay focused spiritually, day by day by day by day. So these things, you know, they don't tire us out, they don't discourage us. You know, some people think, oh, well, that's tiring, you know, the study of God's word or prayer, it takes up time. Where's... No, those aren't the things that tire us. These things refresh us spiritually. The things that tire us out is, is sin. That's what is wearying. Sin is what's wearying. A lack of focus on the spiritual things and the love of the world that cause fatigue and discouragement, weakness, failure to finish the race. Whenever my eyes are off, off of Jesus, whenever my eyes are on myself or the problem or the task or how long will I make it, whenever my eyes go on those things, that's when I begin to feel unsure and tired spiritually. And when my focus is reset, then I, I gain strength, then uh, I'm spiritually refreshed. So the author um, addresses the, the difficulties that they are encountering as a result of their faith and he tries to put these things into perspective, because he's not saying it's an easy race. You know, he's saying stay focused because it's hard. And so now he's going to try to put into perspective, you know, why are they suffering these obstacles? You know, they're the, the, these things you know, that are happening to them and things that happen to us in our lives, they're not mindless events without purpose, but rather things that God uses to mold their character in their time and our character today and to penetrate our faith, to get inside of our faith. And so we continue in verse four. He says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. So after describing the faithful lives of the Old Testament people and the supreme example of Jesus Christ, he then asks the readers to compare their suffering with that of, of, of all those people. You know, compare your suffering to the suffering of Jesus to the suffering of the people in the Old Testament who persevered uh, because of their faith. And his point is, if these had not you know, given up faith in the face of death, why should you give up faith? Because of the obstacles that you're facing. 
he continues, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by Him. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. So he explains that the trials and the sufferings are used by God as methods to mold and to teach it. He doesn't say that God is the one that creates those things. He's saying that God uses those things. We're wrong in saying, oh God, you sent me the cancer. Oh God, you sent me the, you know, the broken leg or the car. God doesn't do that. He doesn't send that. But He uses that. And this is how the author is putting this into perspective. The fact that there are sufferings in life is common to all men, not just believers. But the fact that there are trials caused by faith, oh, that's a different thing. Trials that come upon you because of your faith, this is proof that some men are sons of God. Not all suffering is proof that we are children of God, lest this be the criteria for salvation. If, if suffering is the thing you need to do to go to heaven, well, a lot of people in you know, developing countries, third world countries, poor countries, people in, you know, in civil war, the, the Syrians, for example, in Syria, hundreds of thousands of people have been murdered and bombed and so on and so forth. If suffering is the way to get you to heaven, well, we're not going to make it, not in this country. But suffering is not the way to get to heaven. You know, faith is the way to get to heaven. God never made suffering the criteria for going to heaven. However, what he's saying here, suffering on account of your faith, however, this is proof that God is working in your life. And the author says, and he does so by quoting an Old Testament scripture, that this has always been the case. God has always worked in the lives of those who are suffering because of their faith. For the one who disbelieves, well, his suffering produces very little result, and in the end, it's a sad reminder of sin and death. However, for the Christian, all suffering, specifically brought on by one's faith or as a result of human frailty, all suffering in this way can and is used by God to produce spiritual maturity. And so he continues in verse seven. He says, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? So suffering for our faith's sake is a proof of our sonship, he says. And the author parallels a natural father's relationship to his son with God's, relationships, uh, God's relationship with his sons, his children, Christians. You know, at the time, illegitimate children were not considered uh, worthy of their father's attention. So an absence of trials um, um, uh, is a sign of inattention, if you wish. All right, that's, the, that's the mindset that he's coming from, that the author is coming from. You know, adopted children, you know, they, were, uh, they were ignored, you know, they did what they wanted. They didn't, they didn't get the attention of the father in that time. Uh, but the true fathers, right, natural fathers, we, we expect our earthly uh, fathers to, um, um, uh, to punish us, to discipline us, and we submit to their discipline. Should we not, he says, therefore respect and submit to the heavenly Father with a hope of greater results stemming from His correction? You know, he's using the natural you know, family uh, uh, experience of being disciplined by a father. You know, your father, you know, if your father's pay, disciplining you, it's because he knows your business. He's paying attention to what's going on. He doesn't approve of what's happening, or he's, he's wanting you to kind of grow in a certain way, disciplining you, correcting you. And he simply makes a parallel thing. He says, well, you know, if you're suffering because of your faith, things are happening on account of your faith, you're, 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 there are trials and conveniences and so on and so forth, simply a demonstration that God is working with you. You know, so don't, you know, the, the, it's the opposite. Some people they think, oh, because I have trouble, God is mad at me, or I've done something wrong. 
You know, no. You know, something is happening in my life, I'm suffering because of my faith. Oh, God's working in my life. He's paying attention. Okay. So we keep going, verse 10 and 11, he says, for they discipline for a short time as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, so that we may share uh, holiness, uh, share His holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So here the author compares uh, the discipline of earthly and heavenly fathers. Earthly parents are sinful, they're inconsistent, they're temporal, uh, they're, they're doing their best to prepare us for life here in this world. The Heavenly Father, however, is perfect and fair, and He can provide correction from the beginning to the end of our lives, and has as its purpose to make us holy like He is holy, and thus enabling us to share in His eternal nature. In other words, you know, our Father is doing the best they can to kind of you know, help us live in this life, but the Heavenly Father He's not doing just the best He can, He's giving us the best, the perfect correction. And He doesn't just discipline us for a little while and then let us go. No, He's, he's correcting and disciplining, forming us you know, for our entire lives, not simply to live in this world, but to be like He is, to prepare us actually for the world to come. So discipline, both earthly and heavenly, is, is never pleasant, but it is fruitful especially when given by God, because it ultimately uh, produces the spiritual fruit of peace that comes from a right standing with God. And how does this happen, you may ask? Well, if we endure trials faithfully, our hope for eternal life will be very strong. And this hope produces peace of mind. You know, the stronger your hope is, in the reward that you are about to receive from God, the more peace of mind that you experience. So after explaining the reasons for their sufferings and the possible benefits, the author goes on to encourage them in verses 12 and 13. Now he's already mentioned the immature, the weak, the unfaithful, those who are discouraged among them. Now he goes on and tells them to encourage these brethren. And he uses the illustration of a healthy body with weak and injured members to make his point. And this exhortation has two steps. Number one, he says, brace up the weak member uh, in verse 12. He says, therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are fable, uh, feeble. Uh, you know, medical terms, a brace, you know, a cast. Right? Something is, the knee is out of whack, out of joint, we put a brace on it right, to straighten it up. Because if you leave the knee crooked, what will happen? You'll be limping, you'll be out of shape. And, and, and one thing, you know, the body, everything's connected. All of a sudden your back starts to hurt, your hips are hurting, your other knee starts to swell. Why? Because you're all out of sync. So in a physical body, you brace up the knee. Right? You, you straighten it out, you correct it, you, make, you, know, you, you, you learn back, you know, physical therapy, you learn how to walk naturally again, and this affects the whole, you know, the whole human body, the whole physical body. Well, in a spiritual sense, that's what we have to do with weak members, right? We do this, however, by encouragement, by teaching, by correction, by helping them. Not by anger, not by getting mad at them, but rather uh, by helping them and using words of, of encouragement. Uh, towards those who are weak. And then the second thing he says, uh, go straight. Go straight, verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed, right? That's the second part. You brace it up, and then you know that physical therapy part where you learn how to walk properly, you know? same idea here. You know, brace up the knee, brace up this, the, the, the injured part, and, and make it learn how to walk correctly. You know, to go straight, once the weak member is braced up, the rest of the body should kind of come back into a normal, a normal state. In other words, once the spirit is supported, it can more easily avoid the damaging effects of habitual sin. And the thing that he's talking about, the, the, the member that is injured you know, spiritually is probably injured because of sin, because of a bad habit, because of a lack of faith. 
when you strengthen that part with encouraging words, with teaching, so in correction, then that, that weak part of that individual's faith, spiritual life is strengthened, and that person can then walk straight again, walking in the light, walking without that uh, encumbering sin. So by bracing up the weak members and then going straight for the goal, because he talked, you know, going straight, not just for the sake of going straight, going straight like, you know, he says, stay focused on the goal, putting them back on that straight path towards the goal, then the weak will be carried along by the strong and ultimately they'll be healed. We don't, you know, we don't amputate the leg you know, just because the joints out of, you know, we don't amputate the leg, we don't cut the leg off, right? Unless it's dead, you know, unless there's rot, then we cut it off. If it's weak, we fix it, we brace it, it's the same thing. It's the same thing with weak brothers and sisters who are tangled up in sin or weak because of the faith. We don't just cut them off and get rid of them. No, we, we help them, we strengthen them so that they can get back into the, back into the race. And then in verses 14 to 17, uh, he issues a warning. He goes from practical advice on what they should do to a warning against the things that they should avoid doing. And he gives the example of Esau as one who lost his blessing because he made poor choices. Okay? So he, uh, we read in verse uh, 14, switches gears here, he says, pursue peace with all men. And so here's the warning, here's the exhortation, if you wish. Avoid conflict, he says. It seems that the problems within their church, the people he was writing to, it seems that the problems within their church were either caused by uh, 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 people who were creating conflict, and to this he urges them to avoid conflict by pursuing peace. You know, conflict, even for the best of reasons, often cause many to turn away from Christ. And so he says, uh, find ways to produce peace. Um, and usually, you know, the things that we have to do to pursue peace or to find peace usually cost us our pride or our position. Somebody has to swallow, somebody has to back down, somebody has to kind of lower the, uh, the rhetoric, somebody has to lower the flame of anger and passion there. So he says, you know, avoid, avoid conflict, avoid conflict. Secondly, he says, avoid unholy living, verse 14b. Um, and the sanctification, he says, without which no one will see the Lord. Avoid unholy living. To sanctify means to be separate unto the Lord. And so avoid unholy alliances, unholy practices, unholy attitudes of, 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 uh, of, of, of actions and pursue a continued separation of self to the Lord. Things that you can do. Things that you can do in the church to maintain a healthy, strong faith, to pursue you know, the goal, to stay focused on the goal. So things you, you know, things you do to help other people, and then just things that you do. Avoid conflict, avoid unholy living. Sanctified people encourage others, maintain peace within the assembly, and never are a cause for others uh, to fall away. And speaking of others to fall away, another uh, encouragement, another warning, he says, avoid spoiling other people. And so in verse 15 he says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. So he says, you know, some may give up following Christ because of a lot of reasons because of sin, because of faithlessness, because of cowardliness, whatever. And others act as a, a, a general cancer in that they fall away and like a poison they bring others with them. For example, you know, their discouragement discourages others. Their lack of faith weakens the faith of others. Their sinfulness, their activity you know, that is sinful infects and affects other people as well. So some people just quit because they're weak. And he says we need to encourage them. Other people, you know, they quit, but they bring a lot of people down with them. And so he warns these people that the damage that they cause to others may be irreparable, even if they themselves 
once repent. So um, let's break into the passage here, 16 and 17, kind of, you know, he highlights this idea. He says, that there be no immoral or godless persons like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit uh, the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. So he warns them uh, the damage that, you know, uh, uh, that some may cause to others, and he talks about the irreparable damage. And again, we read about Esau here as the example of that. You know, some things we do causes destruction that cannot be fixed, even if we ourselves repent and change our ways. You know, we gossip against somebody in the church, whatever, the thing gets out, it's not true, that person is hurt, their feelings are hurt, they're insulted, they're offended. You try to, you, know, you realize you're wrong, you apologize to them, but it's, it's done, they quit, they're gone. You're staying, you've repented, you realize you did something wrong, you tried to make it right, but you know, it wasn't enough, too little, too late. And that's the human and spiritual casualty. And he uses Esau here as an example of one who exchanged his birthright as firstborn, and of course, the blessings and the privileges that accompanied this position, he sold this to his brother Jacob for a bowl of stew because he was hungry. Esau was uh, impulsive, he was an unholy man, and this attitude brought him to making this, this foolish decision. Later on, as the writer says, later on he regretted it and he changed his mind and he wept before God and his father you know, to give him back his position, but it was too late. What was done was done. And we see, of course, later on in Esau's life that he changed. He was wiser, he was more reverent of God, he reconciled with his brother Jacob, but this did not change the results of his previous mistakes. So those who spoil others may regret and they may repent, but many times the damage done cannot be changed. So he warns them, be careful, be careful. So there's the warning part of his letter. Then he, he moves into a kind of an exhortation, an encouragement. Now remember that originally the author was giving practical instructions on what to do, you know, encouragement, and what to avoid doing, avoid conflict, avoid unholiness, avoid spoiling others. So in this passage he gives a reason why these practical instructions should be followed. Basically, the reason is we should not practice dissension and immorality because we belong to the kingdom of God and this conduct will not go unpunished. And this idea has always been so and will always be so. So you know, avoid doing this, try doing this, and remember if you disobey, uh, just like the ones who disobeyed in the past were punished, you'll be punished too. So he gets this kind of idea across in the following way. He compares the settings between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between Judaism and Christianity. So he starts by describing Judaism once again, verse 18. He says, for you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and, and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound uh, which sound was such that those who uh, heard begged that no further word would be uh, spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. So that's the, that's the Old Testament, right? The author's portrait of how people saw God and His dealings with them with descriptions contained in the Old Testament. And the scene is from the people gathering at Mount Sinai in the desert. And so Moses and the people, you know, when they met with God, they were terrified at the signs. I mean, the blazing fire, darkness and gloom, whirlwind, the trumpet blast, the harsh words, the awesome sight. All of these things heralded the presence of God among the people here on earth. So their image of God 
and his kingdom told them that they were not to come near for fear of defilement and death, that they were unworthy, that they were unholy. And their fear urged them to obedience. And yet, because here we're really talking about obedience, and yet they never were faithful to God. This terrifying vision never brought them nearer to living a holy and faithful life. They saw this terrible thing and it scared them to death almost. And yet this vision and this experience could not move them to be faithful. And we know that, right? In the desert, they all, that generation all died. Why? They were faithless. All right, so now he gives another vision, a vision of Christianity, beginning in verse 22, he says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So, the image of God revealed through the new covenant, Christianity, is one of God being with His people, not on earth, but in heaven. You know, the image of the Old Testament was God was at the mountain. You know, this is God with His people on earth. The image that the writer is giving us is, this is God <laughs> in heaven, okay, with His people. The scene is, is still awesome and majestic and gracious, but it's not there to instill fear and rejection, but rather one of praise and comfort and, 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 and invitation. Christians are not gathered at the, at the desert or in the desert at Mount Sinai. They're not at Mount Sinai, but they're at Mount Zion. This is the Old Testament word for Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, Jerusalem was the city of God because the temple was there. But in the New Testament, it was a symbol for heaven because that is where God really dwelt. They're not surrounded by gloom and fire and whirlwind and a terrible sound of trumpet and harsh words. That's not their experience, I mean Christian's experience. They're among, what does he say, myriads of angels. And what are they doing? Praising God. They're among the church, the brethren. They're with God, the Father. They're with Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, and His sacrifice, which unlike Abel's blood, you know, Abel's blood cried out for vengeance, but Jesus' blood seeks out forgiveness and opens the doors of the celestial city where Christians have been invited to enter in as eternal guests. In the Old Testament, God was saying, don't even come close to me lest you die. In the New Testament, God is saying, come on in. <laughs> You're welcome. I've been, I've, been, I've been waiting for you to come. So in arguing for proper conduct, the author first begins by comparing the two settings where the people found themselves. One in the past and one they are now in today. In the last verses of this chapter, he's going to show that even though the settings are different, God is the same. He didn't tolerate disobedience and unfaithfulness in the past, and He doesn't tolerate it now. Because in the past there was, you know, don't come near you know, because of death. In the New Testament, what does He say? We're going to be judged. We're invited, but we're going to be judged. And so the point He's making, of course, is that obedience to God is, is necessary. The author makes the argument that says, if they refused to heed God's warning through the terrible signs of His presence given here on earth, and they were punished for it, imagine the culpability for those who have seen the signs of God's presence in the heavenly sanctuary and still disobeyed. So Christ who died and resurrected and ascended into heaven is He who speaks, He who warns from heaven to remain faithful and to obey. So verse 26 and 7, well 25 first, he says, See to it that you do not refuse Him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape uh, who turn away from Him who warns from heaven. So that's, I made that point previously. You know, in the Old Testament, you know, uh, God gave a terrible vision and said, you know, don't approach. 
In the New Testament, he gives a fantastic vision, uh, an encouraging vision. And he said, if the people in the Old Testament were punished because they disobeyed and they had that vision, imagine the punishment for those who see this marvelous vision and still disobey. And so in verse 26 and 7, as I said, the writer says, and his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may uh, remain. So when God's voice spoke the first time, in giving the law and establishing His people and His holy place, the entire world shook and was affected. Verse 26 here is taken from Haggai, chapter two, verse six, who wrote of the reconstruction of the temple during the period of restoration. His thought was that once the temple was built, God would shake the nations in order to fill the temple with all of its treasures. The author takes this passage and he uses it in connection with the end of the world, that when Jesus returns, not only will the nations be shaken, but the entire cosmic order will be dissolved. And so the point, always looking for the point, the point here is that when this happens, only those things that cannot be destroyed will survive. And the only thing that will survive the return of Jesus without being destroyed will be His faithful and obedient church. You know, those who encourage the weak, those who stay focused, those who avoid conflict and unholy living, those who avoid spoiling others, okay? Those are the ones, he says, when the Lord comes, they will not be shaken but everything else will be destroyed. All right, so there's a lot of ideas you know, crammed into just a few verses there. Let's just summarize these, okay, without reading all the various scriptures. Let's summarize some of the ideas that we've talked about. Number one, the author begins the chapter by explaining to his readers that the, the clearer view that they have of God and Jesus and His promises should produce a stronger faith in them than people in the past who did not have that clear vision. Number two, he says that this faith should motivate them to holy behavior and perseverance despite the obstacles that they face. Number three, he reminds them that when they face trials, they should first of all stay focused on Christ, not the trials, not the world, and not themselves. They should remember that trials are a proof of legitimate sonship where God is perfecting their faith. And thirdly, they should realize that trials are not a punishment from God, they are a spiritual refining process if we endure them through faith. Idea number four. Next, he tells them to encourage each other, especially the weak, and avoid things like conflict and unholy living, which discourage others, which destroys faith, and of course makes an individual unable to stay focused on the goal, on the prize. And then finally, in verses 28 and 29, he tells them to be grateful for the blessings that they have in Christ uh, in Christ Jesus. All right, so he says in uh, verses 28, 29, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, remember what I said, you know, everything will be taken apart except the kingdom, that's going to stay. He says, a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So he shows how blessed they are by comparing the revelation of God uh, that the Old, Tes uh, Old Testament people have in light of the glorious revelation that the New Testament people have received. And so the comparison suggests that to reject God's offer of grace revealed through Jesus Christ is the height of ingratitude since it is revealed so gloriously and promises so much. You know, I mean, the people who had much less than you had, 
They remained faithful despite the trials. And you people who have been given so much, it'll be terrible if you deny, if you are unfaithful. That's the point he's making. So the chapter ends with the reminder that the glory of God and His mercy revealed by Christ does not erase the terrifying side of His justice, which will be exercised on all who reject His offer of mercy and forgiveness. So let's have a few encouraging ideas as we kind of wrap up this, uh, this uh, lesson today. First of all, um, let's stay focused on Jesus. You know, our trials and difficulties overwhelm us only when we take our focus off of Jesus and begin concentrating exclusively on our problems. We become unfaithful and we see no difference in our lives, uh, but foolishly ignore the fact that we could be swept away in a moment without Christ. You know, we think, oh, I'm not doing so well. Have you ever realize that if you abandon Christ, you, you, could, you could go in a moment? You know, he says, without me you can do nothing, and he really means nothing. So the prayer and the study and the strengthening of our faith through service and worship, this prepares us for the day when the storm comes, and believe me, the storm will come. And when it comes, remember that uh, more than ever we must keep our eyes on the Lord and avoid shifting it to our trials or how we feel and so on and so forth. Another thing, Suffering is not an excuse for unfaithfulness. You know, trials and suffering are part of everybody's lives, believer and non-believer. Being a Christian doesn't protect us from suffering. Often it causes more problems, right? So we need to remember that when, as Christians, we do suffer trials, we need to remember that it's not a sign that God is punishing us, but rather that God is intimately involved in our lives. Unlike unbelievers, our trials can work to produce everlasting rewards. So let us never use our trials as an excuse to abandon Christ or the church, certainly not to curse God, but rather see these things as tools that God is using to test our faith and to mold our character. And then one more, <clears throat> let's always keep a proper vision of God. You know, we, 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 we tend to see God as we want to see Him. You know, the nice God, the funny God, the indulgent God, the mean God. But the only description of God that has any accuracy is the one contained in His word. It says that He is merciful and that He is kind and compassionate to those who seek Him and obey Him and trust Him. But it also says that for those who disobey, who are unfaithful, who are ungrateful, He's a consuming fire. Both of these are realities. Both of these are true. A proper attitude in prayer and worship and conduct will only be developed when we recognize both facets of God's character, His love and His justice. We need to ask Him to help us avoid becoming too frightened, of course, or too complacent. Because if we're too frightened, we're frozen in place, we can't do anything. And if we're too complacent, we're no longer useful in His kingdom. All right, so there's uh, uh, chapter 12, a lot of ideas compacted into a, a very brief uh, chapter. We're going to continue next time, uh, chapter 13, the final chapter and the final lesson in this series. Thank you very much for your attention.